Okay, so this, what I wanted to talk about uh, today was a parametric study of the January 2006 eruptions of Augustine Volcano. These eruptions uh, up in Alaska occurred starting in January 2006, had a fairly long precursory sequence, which gave us a lot of time to prepare. We got a lot of instruments out there on the ground. And as a result, this was the best studied eruption that we ever had in Alaska at the time it occurred. And even though we've had a few good ones since then, it's still probably the best one as far as instrumentation of a wide variety of types. So I'm a seismologist. I was trained as a volcano seismologist, and I mainly do seismic data. The last couple of years, I branched out into acoustic data, uh, basically calibrated microphones. And in particular, we look at infrasound, which is low frequency, which is below 20 hertz, which means you can't hear it. It's below the human threshold of hearing, but there's significant sound energy out there. And then uh, lightning was kind of an, an oddity uh, that Augustine was the place where we switched over from uh, phenomenological and anecdotal evidence to some instrumental data. So I threw in a little bit of that as part of this talk. The talk this afternoon will be almost entirely about volcanic lightning. And so this, they're sort of complementary in a way. At the time I was putting these together, I thought this talk was going to be tomorrow. So the slight, uh, that's why I didn't want to really you know, take the thunder out of the story later, so to speak, uh, by putting lightning in now. But it's just, it was impossible to change this talk completely. Uh, without really messing up the flow and things. Okay, so Augustine is a volcano in Alaska. It erupted in 2006, and I already forgot to say one thing. Um, down here, Mike, sorry, Mark mentioned that I'm with the Alaska Volcano Observatory. Alaska Volcano Observatory is a combined effort in the U.S. of three organizations. The University of Alaska Geophysical Institute, which is where I work, I'm a research professor there. About half of my funding comes from AVO. The U.S. Geological Survey, which is federal, and the Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys, which is the state survey. So there was a time, uh, AVO was formed about 20 years ago. And for a long time before that, it was sort of competitive and uncoordinated and people are working on various things uh, and overlapping and fighting over turf and all that. And then people finally decided, actually, ironically, it was the Augustine eruption 20 years ago in 1986 that finally caused the Alaska Volcano Observatory to be formed. People finally said, you know, this is nuts. We should work together, pool our resources, avoid redundancy. And so that was done at that time. So I end up, I end up in, of the three legs of the stool, we call it a three-legged stool, you know, the idea that the, cool, the stool can't stand if you take any one of the legs away. Um, I'm on the university side of it. Okay, so here's, can everybody see this okay? Okay. Um, Here's an overview of the talk. I'll give a little bit about the background about the volcano and its precursory activity. Then I'll focus on the seismic and infrasound data that occurred during a series of explosive eruptions in January. And then the lightning at the end. Now, in terms of how the study developed, the lightning instrumentation was not installed until a couple days before January 28th. So I can't talk about lightning for all of it. That's why the talk is organized this way. We were on the ball enough to have all of our seismic and infrasound sensors in place prior to the activity, which is, which is good. OK, so here's Augustine. It, is there a laser pointer? Ah. Steve, it's only one roll. You can't touch the screen. All right, Let's see if I can, I can do that. Uh, now, does this show up on the uh, filming back there? OK, so Augustine's down here. It's a small island on Cook Inlet. And it's about, yikes, I touched the screen, E. Uh, it's about 170 or so miles from Anchorage, which is Alaska's largest city. What, here's Wasilla. Probably heard of Wasilla. That's where Sarah Palin is from. Half of Alaska's population lives on this area shown on the map here. And the wind usually blows from the west toward the east. So the ash potentially, if it's blowing to the northeast at all, the ash from volcano, the ex from explosive eruptions, can affect a, a big part of Alaska's population. Augustine's an island, as I mentioned. There it is, picture of it there. A little bit of steam coming out of it. This was from, the photo was taken in June of 1989. It had previous eruptions. There was one in 1812, 1883. This one had a big landslide associated with it, 1935, 63, 64. This is just before the Great Alaska Earthquake, big magnitude 9.3 earthquake. There was one in 1976, 1986, and then 2006. So it's, it's one of Alaska's more active volcanoes. It's certainly in the top half dozen or so. 
So here's the chronology. This is just walking you through the time sequence of events. We started to see an increase in the seismicity. This is small earthquakes occurring under the volcano. They started in May 2005. Rock falls, surface activity, loose rocks starting to fall on the mountain, started to occur in May and August. Deformation in the forms of inflation. We had GPS instruments there. The inflation started in the fall of 2005. The seismicity, seismicity reached a higher level of 68 earthquakes per day on November 25th. So the next day or a couple days later, we, went, we changed our color code to code yellow. We use a color scheme. It's a little bit like a traffic light with one extra color. You know, green is fine, nothing happening, everything normal. Yellow, first level of, of warning. Orange, second, and red is the highest of full-fledged eruptions in progress. So co significant things happen. When you go to code yellow, we have to switch over to an organization and start having daily updates of the activity, you keep our website up to date every second, have somebody available 24-7, these sorts of things. Um, in December 2005, uh, just after the American Geophysical Union meeting, which is down in San Francisco, uh, a couple days after that meeting ended, we're just getting back in our offices and the phone starts ringing off the hook. There's steam explosions, people are smelling sulfur in the area. So we spent, instead of going on Christmas vacation, we spent a lot of that time putting new instruments out on the volcano. You might imagine Alaska in December and January, it's pretty cold and there's not much light, so it's kind of nasty conditions. Our technicians got a gold star for getting all the instruments put in the ground. But it paid off, the, uh, the seismic swarm increased dramatically on January 10th, and on January 11th, the explosive eruption started, continued for about two weeks, and then switched over into what we call the continuous phase of eruption. So mainly I'm gonna be talking about these, the large-scale explosive activity, and uh, first we'll talk about the precursors. Okay, so scientists like data. In our case, seismic data come from seismometers, come from instruments, so this is, the status of the monitoring network in November 2005. The red is seismometers, the blue are GPS receivers. So six or seven seismometers, five or six uh, GPS instruments, pretty good coverage for a small island volcano, 14 sites. But by the beginning of January 2006, because we, you know, we all thought something was going to happen, we increased the number of GPS and seismic instruments to a total of 24. So we almost doubled the number of instruments. This is one of the things that you can do when you have a slow precursory sequence. You have some time to prepare. Um, in 2008, Akmak erupted. The total precursory sequence lasted five hours. We didn't have time to do anything, and all of a sudden we had a big eruption with an ash column up to, to 16 kilometers. This one, we had an eight and a half month precursory sequence, so we had time to respond, put instruments in the ground, and make sure we were on top of it. So that's part of the reason it's one of the, the best monitored ones. Okay, so here's a graph showing a couple things over the scale here. This is number of earthquakes per day. So each is histogram, each bar going in time. So the activity began to increase a month or so before this plot started. The red is cumulative. The blue bars are the number of events per day. So you can see that it's gradually ramping up, but it doesn't do it absolutely steadily. It goes up, drops back down a bit, goes up, drops down, up, down. But the average seismicity, the average number of earthquakes per day is quite a bit higher over on the right here than it is on the left. And you can see that by this slope of the red line gradually increasing. So this is one of the things that volcanoes do. This is a pretty typical thing. This is why seismologists like to study volcanoes. They produce lots of earthquakes beforehand. The words at the bottom, process, increasing pressure under the volcano. Um, if you go to the surface of the volcano, you don't see any, any changes at the surface, aside from a, a slight uh, deformation late in the sequence in here. So we think what's going on is the molten rock is underground there and it's pushing up on the rock from buoyancy forces. And it's, so it's, it's causing stress changes on, in the mountain itself. That's what's causing all those little earthquakes. And that's, that's a lot of what we do on the scientific side is look at the data and then try to figure out what's the underlying process causing that. So part of what contributes to that is where the earthquakes are. Here's a map of the volcano. Each symbol is an earthquake. So this is showing all the earthquakes that occurred from 13th of December 2004 to 17th of January 2006. So it's a period of a little over a year and you notice that all the earthquakes are in a little spot there uh, right under the summit. The summit vent is right about here. Here's a cross section looking in from the side. The dashed line is sea level. So the vast majority of the earthquakes are above sea level. Here's the same thing looking up from the south. Um, again, all the earthquakes. So all the earthquakes are occurring in a shallow little lens, a small pod right under the vent. And the, this one down at the bottom shows it's called a time depth plot. So depth on a vertical axis and time. So you can see there's a few earthquakes and they become more and more numerous and then they're almost continuous here. So this is again a kind of a typical pattern. 
Now, this is the detail, but Augustine's a little bit unusual in that the earthquakes are all occurring in such a tight spot. Usually the precursory earthquakes are spread out a bit more. And uh, the fact that they're all in one spot tells us that the stresses were pretty highly concentrated just in that one spot. They don't seem to have been very distributed. Um, this is something called a spectrogram, and this is one of the ways we tell other kinds of signals. What's shown is data from six different stations, and for each one, the scale here is from zero up to 10 hertz, and it's 15, uh, 10 minutes across. And then the color tells us the strength of the signal. So the black line there is the actual wiggly line, or the seismogram, and so this tells us that this signal is strong at all frequencies from zero up to 10 hertz. Over here, you hardly see anything on the actual wiggly line, but you see there's a change in the spectral content. So this is a teeny little earthquake over here, but this big long thing that lasts about a minute and a half, this is a rock fall. So there's, you know, there's, it, there was, previous to the eruption, there was a steep-sided dome up at the top, and pieces fall off of it and slide down the hill. That process plays out over a scale of a minute or so. As the rocks are going down, rolling and sliding and banging on the ground, they put energy into the ground, which shows up in our seismic systems. So this is how these, these rock falls look. Okay, so here we are stepping through in time now. This is this, uh, on December 12th, the day after this American Geophysical Union meeting occurred, uh, we came back and people that lived in the vicinity, the small villages down here, were, were smelling a sulfur smell. And GINA is Geographic Information Network of Alaska. It's a, a group that downloads satellite data. They, they patched together to make this figure, but they showed suddenly there's a plume about 150 kilometers long sulfur-rich steam plume. This, this was a change in activity. So we're like, you know, we just got back from AGU. From a scientist's point of view, AGU is the big meeting of the year. I think they had 16,000 presentations last year. I mean, it's, it's the big meeting. So everybody kind of gears up, goes to the meeting, and you come back from the meeting, you kind of want to go, Psst, just decompress and go home for Christmas. Well, we came back to this, and all of a sudden, nobody got a break that year. You know, right back out of the frying pan into the fire, you know, make sure everything's working properly, all of our computer system instruments, the whole deal. But this, this is largely what drove it. And then it, then it was just a waiting game. It was, you know, how long is it going to do this until it finally starts to go? So a little bit about deformation. This is looking at east, north, vertical, three components of deformation on GPS relative to a site over on the mainland. And you can see it's pretty flat here, a little bit of fluctuations. And then all of a sudden over here in the fall, something starts to happen. So this particular site is moving to the east, to the north, and up. So this is the doming up of the island. So as the magma is warming its way up, getting to shallow levels, it pushes against the rocks and pushes them up and outward. So this particular station is over to the east. It's moving to the east, telling us that the volcano is inflating. So that's this bit here. And then you see the last four days, it really takes off much more dramatically. So the rate of strain, the rate of deformation increases rather dramatically here. Oddly, at the time, when the horizontal, so it's moving out sideways, it's not moving up that much. So this tells us that the position where the deformation is occurring has also changed. So if you hold the position steady, then the three various components should react similarly. So you're either changing the geometry or the orientation or the position of the source to get this kind of effect. So now we got seismic increase, we got steaming of the ground, we got deformation of the ground. That's the big three, that's the troika. That's the, when you're working on active volcanoes, that's what they do before they erupt. Increase in earthquake activity, increase in deformation, bulging of the ground surface, and increase steaming. So we got all three of these things, and then it's just a waiting game. So we didn't have to wait too long in this case. I think we put our last instruments in the ground uh, January 5th, 6th, 7th, something like that. Um, on January 10th in the evening, got a phone call about midnight uh, saying something's happening. There had been an earthquake swarm. This is a seismogram, so it's a half hour across you notice that the lines are alternately light blue, dark blue, light blue, dark blue. So there's 48 lines. So this is one whole day's worth of seismogram. So we're going along here. It's basically quiet, nothing happening. And then each of these little pulses is an earthquake. And the particular display here is the, the light blue, dark blue is just so you can tell one line from the adjacent one because it starts getting pretty busy in here. You lose the ability. And another feature, which is just a feature of the plot, when the earthquake is big enough to go off scale, it's colored red. That way, just at a glance, you can pick out the big ones. So we got all these earthquakes. There's about 700 earthquakes here. So we went from having several earth, a few earthquakes per week as the background, starting having several per day in the early precursor sequence, built up to as many as 70 per day, which is still a pretty high number. 
And now suddenly we have 710 hours. So a dramatic several order of magnitude increase in the rate of earthquakes. So that, that went on for about 10 hours. Then you see this big, long sausage looking thing here. This was the first explosive eruption. So this is kind of a typical sequence, too. You get a long, slow increase in the earthquakes, and then a rather dramatic ramp up in activity. It happened during the same time as the deformation also changed its character, and then leading up to the first explosive eruptions. So we think this is the seismic signature of the final ascent of the magma as it's going up toward the surface. Now, one f other interesting feature of these earthquakes, if you look, this is from a short period station. The name of the station is AUE. We could go back and find it on the map I showed you earlier. You'll see it also on one of the later figures. But these earthquakes have the typical spectrum or the typical frequency content of earthquakes. In other words, the, the frequency of which the, the vibrations when the ground shaking in the earthquake looks typical on this side sort of instrument. But some of the instruments we installed there were a new class of instruments called broadbands. And with broadband instruments, they record a much wider frequency range. And then you can do digital filtering. So we did that. We found out about half the earthquakes on that previous page not only had the high frequency vibrations, but look at the scale here. This is three different components of the seismometer, vertical, east, west, north, south, each one looking at about a half dozen signals. The time here is from 0 to 200 seconds. So at the same time as the high frequencies are happening from each of these little earthquakes, about half of the earthquakes had this big, long period signal. The period of this is about 50 seconds. So that means you're getting kind of a boom, a crack. The, the earthquake ruptures, but then you're getting this very low frequency or long period pulse. Frequency and period are reciprocals of each other, so low frequency corresponds to long period. We think this, again down at the bottom here, process, magma injection and pulses. It wasn't for every earthquake, but for about half of them. We think this is the actual seismic expression of the pulses of magma. In other words, it doesn't just move slowly and continuously, but it has to force its way, it has to push the rock out of the way and force its way into a crack. So the, the high frequency is the, presumably the crack opening, and then the low frequency is a, is a pulse of magma being injected, pushing the rock out of the way, kind of jerking forward. So we think this is the seismic expression of how that process works. To my knowledge, this is the first time this was observed for an eruption of this type. So it's kind of a, a critical observation. It's, it's sort of the smoking gun. We'd always assumed something like this happened, but nobody was really sure. So we finally managed to, to catch it. Not for these. The spectrograms I showed before were from the telemetered stations. This is from a station that wasn't telemetered, and you have to go and reset everything for the spectrograms and do them automatically. One of my, uh, do them manually. One of my colleagues went and did that, but I, I, don't, I didn't bring that stuff with me today. Do you see 50 second uh, significant other volcanoes as well, or does it vary a lot? It varies a lot. Um, typical periods that have been seen in other volcanoes are uh, 10, 20 seconds, uh, a few 30 seconds. I've seen one as long as about 100 seconds. I, I'm not sure what the meaning of the 50 seconds is. It might just be the peculiar stress and volume change conditions here that, that lead to that. There's, there's a lot of room for maneuvering in there. OK, and then, um, OK, so the first eruption occurred January 11th, about 4 o'clock in the morning, local time. Uh, the weather was reasonably good on January 12th, so that we sent out people to do an overflight. Now, prior to the eruption, there had just been completely snow covered. You can see there the dark colors and like this thing worming down the side. This is a lahar. When you take a thermal camera, a forward looking infrared radiometer or FLIR, this is the image you see taken at the same time from the same airplane. So where it's warmer is the hotter colors like the pink. So these are lahars. So there was an explosion at the summit which blew off some pre-existing rock, sent out a bunch of ash. So the ash lying on top of the snow is responsible for the dark color. And then some of the hot fragmental material mixed and melted the ice and snow and made these lahars, which go down various places on the volcano. And then the, the plume, which was previously just pure white steam, now you can see sort of a grayish color. It's got some ash in it. And the, the, the thermally, the initial part of it is, is heated up. These kind of data are ephemeral. Obviously, if the weather's really lousy, you don't get them. But they, they help uh, paint a fuller picture of what's going on. So this is a uh, sort of a summary plot of the seismicity. We'll see this again a couple times. So here's January over here, February and March. So the entire eruption, April, lasted about three months. The precursor sequence is here. There's two kinds of earthquakes shown here. The so-called volcano tectonic earthquake, like that plot I showed you with the 700 earthquakes. Those are earthquakes that have P waves, S waves, 
and are related to fracturing of the ground, typical earthquakes, except they occur in different patterns of volcanoes. The other thing here is the rock falls and explosive events, and we're only showing ones that are larger than a certain amplitude, and we had to pick a reference station. So these are not earthquakes per se. They are seismic signals, but they represent a completely different process. So we show them with a, with a different symbol. So each of the eruptions is shown by a vertical blue bar, and there were 13 of them. So two of them right next to each other are a few minutes apart on January 11th, a uh, half dozen of them on January 13th and 14th, one on the 17th, 10-day gap, and then four more on January 27th. The rate of earthquakes, which are the red symbols, was high early on, and then the number of rock falls and explosive events increases dramatically. Now, you might ask, what's going on out here? The explosions stop, so do the earthquakes, but you get a whole bunch of rock fall events. This is where we started getting a phase of continuous dome growth. So the initial eruption was a series of discrete pulses hours to days apart, big explosions. Then it switches over to continuous eruption, but instead of being explosive, it's continually pushing up a dome, a gentle uh, ash plume going up, pieces falling off the side. The pieces falling off the side make the rock falls. So that's why the number of rock falls goes up dramatically, so dramatically. There was a, things seemed to be declining, uh, a little bit of a data gap. This is the way the real world works. Things go wrong, you lose your data for a while. Things started coming back. Then there was this peculiar time in here when there was continuous volcanic tremor and the dome started growing more rapidly. And so the rock fall rates went up and then a particular time of earthquakes. The earthquakes out here, we called drum beats for a while because they were like carbon copies of each other. It's just like imagine standing beating a drum, just the same exact signal, boom, boom, at very regular intervals. So we were seeing that for, for several days in here near the end of the eruption. Then finally kind of went back to sleep in, in April. Okay, so that was sort of overview of the eruption. We'll see a couple of those, those figures again. This is kind of to get, give us our bearings and see how the whole thing played out. Now we're going to take a little bit closer look at the seismic and infrasound data, which is something the infrasound was new and the broadband seismology was new this time around. And I'm going to show you some systematic relationships between some selected eruption parameters. So you know, we, we look at the data, we make a series of systematic measurements, and then we start trying to see if there's any structure or order in those observations. So I'll show you how I broke it down uh, here is in terms of what I call short, strong eruptions. You'll see why in a minute. Uh, eruptions that followed three days of quiescence, ones that had a low reduced displacement, I'll explain that in a few minutes, but a high ash column, and then some systematics between lightning and duration and some conclusions. So this, was, this is not the end of the story. This is sort of along the way. It's, a, it's an attempt to come to some understanding of what's going on in a, in a kind of a first order way, taking a look at some fairly straightforward observations. So the first one is seismic durations. Now, these are data from a short period instrument. A short period instrument in seismology is one that dominantly records about energy in about one to five hertz or so signal. They're analog instruments, they're easy to telemeter, they're cheap. This is all that we had in 1986 and prior. So if you want to compare the current eruption to the previous ones, which is one of our scientific goals, because first thing somebody will say right away, well, is this eruption the same as the previous ones? Well, yes or no. Or, so we look at these kind of data. But one of the problems is that the data clip or go off scale. So you see that instead of going all the way up, they sort of come up to this flat part here, and it, it evens off. Well, we can actually take advantage of that, because when the signal clips, that's also telling us that it's strong. It's strong enough to saturate this instrument, which happens to be fairly close to the summit. So we can exploit that, and it provides a convenient way to measure the, how long the eruptions last. So from here to here is 10 minutes. So we can see that this one's about three minutes, this one's about six minutes, this is the longest one at 15 minutes. And we can measure the duration of each of them. The first two were only a few minutes apart from each other, so this one here is the same one there. This, this seismogram was just picked up and moved sideways, so that they're all aligned on the start time, which is the, the red line there. So the range we saw was between three and 15 minutes long. Okay, so there's a factor of five variation in a very basic parameter. How long do these explosive eruptions last? Now here's kind of a cool thing. One of my colleagues dreamed this up. One of our uh, technical guys who normally spends his time installing instruments, but he came into my office with a plot like this and said, what do you think of this? What he did is he took the various seismograms from different stations and he tiled them. He simply put one down and then laid the next one on top of it using a different color, laid the next one on top of it. So you can see that the blue station is on top. It's farther away, so it's less sensitive. It shows a shorter signal. The green and red ones are about the same and black is covered in this case. 
So you might ask, what on earth is going on here? See the way the black one continues on much longer? That's the station AUE. Any ideas? There's either a lahar or a pyroclastic flow. So what we're seeing is the primary eruption, which sends the material up into the air, is this early part. Then you can see it stops very abruptly at these other stations, but it continues at this one station. We went out and looked around, and there's a lahar channel about 100 meters away from the station. So most of the eruptive material goes up, but some of it lands on the ground and moves out sideways as a pyroclastic flow. That's a, a sort of a primary part of the eruption. Or as a lahar, which is a water-rich fluid flow that follows down a channel that happened to carry it near the mm -hmm. seismometer. So this is kind of weird. We see evidence of different processes in our, in our seismograms, but we can pull that out by this clever technique of overlaying them. So we see that those flow events happened for these two eruptions and not for the others. If, yeah, for, for, that, for the particular case of lahars, that's, that's right. You'd have to have a, if you knew in advance where your lahar channels were likely to be, you could approach this more systematically and put seismometers in all those places and then use them to track the lahars. And in other places, that, that, uh, techniques like that have been done. Okay, so here, we made reference to that station AUE a couple times. Here it is. AU is for Augustine, E is for East. So AUE is to the East, AUW is to the West. Here's some of the summit stations. Uh, one of the broadband stations, we'll see some data in a minute, is this one here, AUL. Uh, AUE had not only a seismometer and that lahar or pyroclastic flow signal we saw a second ago, but it also had an infrasound sensor, and I'll show you that in a minute. The bad news is all four of these stations on the summit were destroyed in the first few series of explosions. So one of the gambles you take on a volcano is you, you put your stations in the ground you get the, rest, the best resolution of things like depth and location for small events up near the summit if you put your stations right on the summit. Unfortunately, you put them up near the summit, they're the ones that are most likely to be destroyed in an eruption. So this, this generally happens. So that right when you want the data most critically, the data disappear. So here's this, uh, this pressure sensor. Now, pressure sensor is like a, it's a special type of microphone. And if you just put a plain old microphone on the ground out there, it's such a windy, nasty place that you get a huge noise level. So one of the ways, we're interested in low frequency sound, so we put this thing out called a spider. This pipe here goes into the instrument, we'll see that in a minute, and then out on the ground surface, what this is is flexible aluminum conduit with soaker hose inside it, and there's arms about 50 feet long going out in several directions. This is one of my colleagues, Ed Clark, installing the, the sensor. So the, the reason we do this is, this is like a spatial filter. We're interested in low frequency sound energy. The low frequency energy will be pressing down on the ground simultaneously over a wider area because it's low frequency, it's got a long wavelength. And so we pick it up with all these different arms. That'll give a coherent signal. Little gusts of wind and noise will be high in one place, low elsewhere. They tend to cancel each other out. So this is sort of a spatial sampling, a spatial filter to be able to get the coherent low frequency noise, which is what we want. So here it is going into the center. So this is a garden hose coming in into the bottom of the instrument. This is a Chaparral pressure sensor um, at that station, AUE. It's a calibrated microphone. It's flat response up to about 300 pascals. And we treat the data coming out of it like a seismometer. So we take the, the time varying voltage that comes out, we send it into electronics, and we send it on its way through the telemetry path so we can treat it just like a seismometer, keeping in mind that it's actually measuring pressure in the air as opposed to shaking of the ground underground. So here's what we got. Let's take a look at the first explosion that we had. The top trace here shows the infrasound signal. So going along, quiet, 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 boom, whopping big signal here. Now, this big signal occurred here. We know how fast sound travels through the air. It's about 330 meters per second. We know how far away we are, which is about three kilometers. So we can back up and say, okay, the origin of the signal was here in time. Below it is a short period seismometer, and below that, the three components of a broadband seismometer. So the short period seismometer goes off scale. We call that clipping. So here's background noise, beginning of the signal, builds up rapidly, starts to go off scale. The weird thing is the signal originated 14 seconds before this signal, rather than eight seconds. So that tells us this explosion wasn't just a simple pop like you get with a stick of dynamite, but there was some process that started and gave us a seismic expression six seconds before the 
gases escaping reach the atmosphere and started propagating out as, a, as an acoustic signal. So this one goes off scale. You lose the amplitude information. But here you can get a better idea of, of how the signal developed as a function of time. So it started sort of slowly ramped up, then took a couple of wild oscillations in here lasting several seconds each. This is the data from the, from the broadband station. This one is just a little inset to show that if you correct for the different distances, station AUL and AUE are different distances. If you correct for that, they both show the onset of the signal within just a fraction of a second of each other. So we, we, we're pretty sure we're, we're measuring the same thing. So this is showing us these explosions are a little more complicated than we thought. It's not just a single pop, but it's an event that has a time history and something's happening underground for several seconds uh, prior to the gases escaping to the surface. Presumably that's the crack growing or the final breaking. We think of a, a convenient mental picture is that we have sort of a sealed up cap and we've got to break through that cap. So this is the breaking process is what's showing on the seismometer prior to the gases actually venting to the surface, which is uh, the explosion as we, as we normally think of it. These explosions are not all the same. So here's four. The one we just looked at is here. We call that, in generally in seismology and infrasound, we call that an impulsive signal. The I stands for impulsive. So there's this big rapid buildup. The signal is very impulsive, very strong at the beginning. And we, this is energy on, underneath that cumulative energy plot. We see that about 60% of all the energy comes from that first pulse. So this is more like a single pop. It's a, it's a strong pop with a little bit of aftermath happening. Very different from the signal over here, which a couple days later. This one, there's a whole bunch of wiggles and no obvious single pop. If you do its cumulative energy, it just sort of ramps up gradually over time. This, this is what we call an emergent signal. Here's one that's kind of a compound. It starts out emergent, low gradual signal, and has a fairly strong pop that accounts for about 20% of the energy later on. Here's another one that's mostly impulsive. So there was a fair bit of variety in these, in these signals. They're not all the same. I think this is one of the first things we learned is that these events fall into sort of different sort of categories in their, in their attributes. So now if we look at these explosive eruptions in time sequence, here they are, these are days in January. Two occurred within 20 minutes of each other, a few others occurred a few hours apart. So this is how they played out in time. And what we're looking at here is the purple is the, how strong the pressure signal was on the pressure sensor. We see they're up to about 105 pascals. That's a pretty strong signal. We're three kilometers away, but 100, over 100 pascals is a, is a big, strong signal. And the smaller ones were down about 15 or 20. And then the second thing here, the dark blue, is, is the seismic amplitude. For signals like this, we use something called reduced displacement, which is it's the RMS, or root mean squared, amplitude of the signal multiplied by the distance. So in a sense, that corrects for geometrical spreading. You know when you throw a stone in a pond, the, wave, the rings moving out are larger first, and then they get smaller as you go away? Well, the amount of energy is, is relatively constant, but it's being spread over a larger area. We call that geometric spreading. We want to correct for that. So this reduced displacement does that. So this is just showing the, the two scales at the same time. Unfortunately, the data. Do you isolate the body waves when you do that? Or Sorry? Do you isolate the body waves when you make that measure? Well, we analyze what kind of waves are coming out. And there's one correction for surface waves and one for body waves. And for this case, for the stations that we used and did our measurements on, they were uh, uh, mostly surface waves. So we used the surface wave formulation. <laughs> yeah. So body, uh, body waves is uh, 1 over r, and surface waves is 1 over r to the 0.5 for, for the amplitude decay. And energy decay is r squared and r. OK, so um, the data as they occurred in time are shown here, and they're sort of bunched up. Another way to look at the data is to spread them out and just put them in order, events number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, et cetera, which makes it a little easier to spot certain trends. So here are these 13 primary explosions. Each histogram bar here shows how strong the acoustic pressure was. So the first one was quite strong. Then they got smaller, kind of ramped up, built up to this largest one of all, and then dropped back down. Over here is the plume height. So most of the plume heights are about 10 plus or minus 1. There was one big one, uh, a little over 14 kilometers, one small one that was only about 3, a couple other medium ones. So one of the first things that I noticed and got me thinking about this whole line of things, look at this. This is the strongest pressure signal but it's with the smallest plume. What's going on there? Here's the second strongest pressure signal. It had a plume about the same size, but we saw in that very first figure with a little bit of ash and the snow on the ground, there was hardly any ash that came out. So this suggested there's some kind of funny inverse correlation. The stronger the pressure, instead of being a stronger eruption, it's actually a weaker eruption. Very little ash coming out. 
So let's take a look at that. Um, to help guide us through, I made these figures to show a conceptual model. And I have to carefully point out down the bottom, it says not strombolian. These are schematic. You know, volcanologists love to show lava being red. But red lava is associated with, volcanian, uh, with strombolian eruptions, where you literally have incandescent red lava. So I just want to say this is not supposed to be strombolian. It's just to kind of show some ideas. So the idea is, if you have a uniform gas distribution suggested schematically by the bubbles spread out and rapid ascent, then you expect a certain type of activity. That's just one, one end member. If you have degassing during slow ascent and a leaky system, then the upper part of the magma will, will be relatively poor in gas. In other words, it may start like this, but as it rises slowly through the crust, it loses gas to the surroundings. If it does so, then you end up with a relatively gas-poor slug of magma near the surface. Another thing that can happen if the system is sealed up and sits there for a while is you get bubble coalescence. So all these smaller bubbles may come together to form some large, either a large bubble or a large gas pocket. I think in reality it's some grossly irregularly shaped things. Schematically here I just showed as a big bubble just to kind of get the point across. Okay, so it's Yes. Yeah, they imply a time evolution. So there's a, the idea behind this is there's a starting state. The gases are, in some sense, approximately uniformly distributed. I'll, I have to be honest and say I've had some conversations with guys who work on gas a lot, and they say, lousy assumption to start with. But from a seismologist's point of view, it's, it's simply a starting assumption to, to get a rough idea. And the idea, this is, there's a number of studies that back this up. But if the, when you get dome-forming eruptions, if the ascent rate is really slow and you get leaky surroundings, a lot of the gas escapes, and that's when you typically get a dome formed. You can take the same magma and bring it up with a higher ascent rate so the gases stay in solution and you get explosive activity. So that's kind of the, the, the basis for, for drawing these schematics. So the same magma, same gases in it to start with, but you can change the activity by how long it sits there, whether it's sealed or leaky, and then how fast you bring it up to the surface. We, yeah, we, we didn't see that per se, but let me, uh, we'll return to that concept. Let's revisit that a little bit later on uh, when we get to that part of it, because two of the eruptions, the ones that follow the longer periods of quiescence, were the ones where I think this was happening. Uh, and then uh, the, the weird one is one of these that happened late in the game. So let me, I'll step through these now. Okay, so the first two I wanted to look at were these two that were the strongest pressure. And when you look at them this way in the index order, First and second highest pressure, they were also the two strongest seismic ones. So normally a seismologist, the amplitude of the signal is the same thing that feeds into earthquake magnitude. So if you tell a seismologist, this is, these are my two strongest or highest amplitude signals, you would say, oh, highest magnitude, strongest ground shaking, these must be the two biggest in some sense. Well, it turns out these are the two with the least amount of tephra. The first one was the one on January 11th, which destroyed the old pre-existing dome, and then the one on January 28th, the other largest one of all, only had a plume about three kilometers high and was mostly gas. So there, one January 11th, one the 28th, 93 and 105 pascals. The thing about them is they were very short, 20 and 25 seconds, so less than a half minute each um, for the acoustic part of the signal. Seismically, 140, 180 seconds were also the two shortest ones uh, seismically. And then the reduced displacement, 39 and 78. So this is why I call them short, strong ones. They were clearly the two shortest ones, and they were also the two strongest ones. So I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm not very smart, but I figure the name should kind of match with, with their basic attributes. So the, strength, the strange part, and this is the first insight, was that the size of the signal, the strength of the signal, the amplitude, really didn't correlate very well with a lot of ash coming out. So this tells us that these were mostly gas. And uh, schematically, I, I show this, this gas pocket over here. So for whatever reason, the conditions under the ground favored a gas pocket accumulating and then erupting rather abruptly, making a strong pressure signal, but not much ash. So the second ones I want to talk to um, talk about were there were two here. They happened to be the uh, third, and, third and fourth highest acoustic, acoustic pressure and then the third and fourth highest seismic amplitude, these two guys. 
to the ones shown here with the star. This one followed three days of quiescence. This one followed 10 days of quiescence. We know on January 16th, the day before the first of those, uh, the conditions were favorable. We got an airplane in there and we saw a dome. The black lava here is the surface of a growing dome. Now, let's see, I have to say this carefully. Um, publicly available data do not show this prior to the other one, but a colleague who was able to view some other data that are not publicly available told me that I wasn't too far off. So there was probably a dome before the other one too. Okay, so there are, there are pre-existing domes. That's what happened in those three days. The three days it wasn't having an explosive eruption, lava was still coming out, but it was thick, pasty lava with relatively poor gas content that piled up and made a dome. So if we look at those domes, the, the, those eruptions, the quiescence preceding lasted 3.3 days or 10 and a half days. The acoustic pressure, 93 and 83 pascals. The reduced displacement, the size and parameter, about 13. Both of these had strong, our, strong air waves, moderate to long durations, moderate seismic amplitudes. These were the two eruptions that had the most tephra each. So the idea that when you take the magma and have it sit on the ground surface with most of its gas loss, but continue to push up additional magma from below with gases and eventually blow it apart, that combination of parameters appears to be the one that gives you the, the most volume of ash coming out, which is, for most volcanologists, which is the best measure of the size of an eruption. So that, that's, this is the little extra stuff about, perhaps on these time scales, the total time here, 11 days, may not have been long enough to greatly modify the wall rocks in such a way that their, their gross parameters were changed. Also, we're at such shallow depths in the system that when I use words like leaky, uh, at those pressures in the upper few hundred meters and on the time scale of days like this, it seems that it, we don't have any basis for knowing whether it really fundamentally changed the structure around there. It appears to have been leaky by the fact that it was steaming so vigorously, not just right at the summit, but around the, the upper flank area. Okay, then there were the sort of normal ones. These were most of the eruptions. January 13th, there was one at 1300, 1700, 2000, January 14th, uh, one o'clock, about four o'clock. These are all about three or four hours apart. The plumes were remarkably similar, 10, 9, 11, 10, 9 kilometers. The reduced displacement, the seismic amplitude, were very similar from three up to about six, so a factor of two. And then the, the, the pressures on the pressure sensor, 22, 35, 29, et cetera, 50, again, little more than a factor of two, but most of them very similar to each other. These all had pretty high plumes, but small seismic amplitudes. So this, this suggests an explosive combination. Um, these are the ones we're talking about, the sort of ones that are all similar to each other, the small seismic amplitudes, the moderate explosive ones occurring sequentially in just a few hours apart. And we have some, we don't, there weren't too many photographs taken by ground observers because the weather was a little shaky in various places around. This one guy got a clear shot of how these things looked. So this was taken near sunset. The sun is off to the right. Since it's near sunset, that's why it's sort of weird pink colors. This plume was about 10 kilometers high and was taken about 15 minutes after the eruption occurred. So these are, these are fairly explosive eruptions. And this is a classic Vulcanian eruption. Vulcanian is, is one of a eruption style characterized by a volcano called Volcano in, um, in Italy, they're very brief, short duration, but high intensity. And with that, with that characteristic, you tend to get high plumes, but not very much volume of material. And that kind of jives. This is an uh, older version of a plot I made some years ago when looking at how strong is the seismic signal, this reduced displacement of the co-eruption tremor compared to the volcanic explosivity index, which is a measure of the size of eruptions. This is this log scale in terms of the volume of ash. This is log scale in terms of the reduced displacement. If you take the pre-existing data and superimpose Augustine, Augustine kind of stands out because what it had was this fairly weak seismic signal, but plumes that would normally put it in the volcanic explosivity index three category. Now this was, this was weighting the plume height relatively more. If we, what we don't have for Augustine, and this is a handicap in these sorts of studies, we don't have very good volume estimates for the individual eruptions. I suspect the volume of these was quite small. And if you take a weighted combination of volume and plume height, it would probably push it back toward volcanic, volcanic explosivity index two, push all these red points over here. Now suddenly they're superimposed on, on the previous ones. But this is, this is what volcanic eruptions are. They're highly explosive, so you get a big plume going up, 
but they involve small amounts of material and they're very brief. These are sort of classic Vulcanian type explosions. So this is sort of the typical event. There were more of these than any others for this eruption sequence. So just to put that again, this is the schematic. That what I'm thinking is happening is the magma is ascending so quickly it's not losing its gases appreciably. There's, so there's a short interval, just a few hours between the events. The durations are moderate. One other thing I didn't say too much about the others, but these guys very clearly, virtually all of the signals that were emergent, seismically and acoustically, the emergent waveforms that kind of built up gradually were of, from this group of events. So we're seeing a sort of a, uh, some common suite of of diagnostic parameters showing up for all these events that are <coughs> helping us to zero in on some of the features of the gas. So we think basically what's going on, rapid ascent of relatively uniformly degassed magma is the, the characteristic of these signals. All right, a short aside about chemistry. A nice thing to do in science is to hold everything steady and just vary the one parameter that you want. You can't always do that in science, especially geology and things like uh, volcanology, because the earth kind of does what it wants, and we come in afterward and try to clean up the mess. The initial explosions were basaltic andesite, and then after that one that put up the highest plume on January 17th, there was a switch to high silica andesite, which characterized that period uh, of the, the last four explosive eruptions, and then the initial part of continuous activity when it switched over to dome growth, then the high silica andesite went away, and the, the later dome growth in February and March was uh, back to the basaltic andesite. In terms of the overall explosive activity, it seems to have been fairly minor impact. Uh, it just, the thing just fell. Can you still hear me okay in the sound? Okay. Thanks. Um, so there may be some systematic change in the activity as a result of this change in the chemistry. If so, we haven't been able to, to pin it down yet and say exactly what went on. Uh, normally what happens is as the magma becomes more silicic, it becomes stronger and typically can hold a higher gas content. So all the things being equal, we would expect it to be more explosive uh, during that time. But we haven't seen a real strong signal that corresponds with the, with the uh, chemistry change. I, I mention it more for the sake of completeness. So then back to, to summary. So that, that occurred. The initial series of events occurred here with the low silica andesite, the high silica andesite over here, and ending right about in here sometime, and then switching back to the low silica andesite. So it was that series of explosions in here on late January and the first part of the continuous dome building eruption that was characterized by the high silica andesite and then drifting back. Okay, so I had a project on the side looking at lightning, and with this first couple series of eruptions, we got reports from pilots that they saw lightning in the plume. People on the ground didn't see it because the weather was lousy down low, but some pilot reports came in. So I called up the guys who run the uh, lightning system for the Bureau of Land Management in Alaska. Now, Alaska, my part of Alaska in Fairbanks is kind of a continental interior, and like the continental interior down in the lower 48 in, in Canada too, you get these big thunderstorms that develop in the summertime. And the lightning flashes that go from the cloud down to the ground often start forest fires. So in my area, we get a bunch of forest fires. So the Bureau of Land Management runs a lightning detection system. In the summer, they have like 11 stations going. But in the wintertime, they mothball it. And they only have four or five stations running. So I called them back up, tell them the volcano was erupting. If it did, it, you know, it might make some lightning. And they agreed to turn back on a couple stations. So for this two-week period, uh, in Alaska, it was like the first two weeks of Alaska, there were three lightning flashes detected, two right over the vent and one a few kilometers away. These were the only three lightning flashes detected in all of Alaska for that two-week period. So we figured, okay, we did good. We got, we got some lightning. This is, this is good. It, it confirmed something we thought was happening. This, this network only catches the very strong lightning and is specifically tuned to catch lightning that goes from the plume down to the ground, which has a couple characteristics that are, can be, that are tunable, longer scale length, longer time history, richer and low frequencies. So, a little example of scientific networking and how that works. I was talking to my lightning collaborator, a guy named Earl Williams at MIT. I told him about the Augustine volcano erupting. So, Earl found out through his network of buddies that New Mexico Tech had just finished testing a new lightning mapping array. They 
developed these new instruments and took them out in the field in Oklahoma and recorded some lightning storms. So he told the New Mexico guys about Augustine erupting, and he told me and AVO colleagues about New Mexico Tech. So suddenly we started exchanging phone calls. I was you know, talking with people I'd never met uh, at New Mexico Tech. We agreed to do a collaboration. So these guys came up. Again, we never met. We just made a verbal agreement over the phone, and they came up from New Mexico to Alaska in January, and I give them credit for being pretty brave or foolhardy. Uh, they came up and installed their instruments in Homer and Anchor Point, two towns down, uh, not, they're fairly close to Anchorage and they're on the road system. They finished putting the instruments in on January 26, and then the last four eruptions that I showed you in the previous part of the talk started happening on January 27th and 28th, and we got state-of-the-art instrumental data obtained, which led to a science paper in 2007. So this is a nice example of, you know, part of what we do as scientists is keep abreast of developments in other fields and constantly talking to people telling them what you're doing. This is why you do it, because research opportunities emerge. Even if they're done on a handshake or a phone call or people who never even met, you sometimes step into a situation and get some, some good things happen. So here's a couple of basic facts, and the afternoon talk is all about lightning, so you'll see some of this stuff again. But li volcanic lightning has been spotted at 87 volcanoes, well over 200 eruptions. It spans the entire range of basalt to rhyolite. And if you make a histogram of the plume heights, you see a bimodal distribution. Some of the, there's a bunch of plumes down between one and four kilometers and kind of a gap and then a second peak around uh, seven to 12 kilometers. And the reason I knew Earl Williams because he and I had collaborated on doing a project looking at this worldwide data set and we got some NSF money and NSF grant to, to look at this data set and make some conclusions. And you'll hear about that in the afternoon talk. But just looking at that bimodal part, and I'll link this to Augustine, so here's this broad peak between 1 and 4 hertz, and it drops down and builds back up again between about 7 and 12 kilometers. So one thing we know is this is the size of ordinary thunderstorms. You know, most of your typical meteorological thunderstorms are about 10 kilometers, plus or minus a bit. So the kind of surprise to us, what's going on over here with this smaller peak on the histogram? So here's Augustine again. These two places, Augustine's here, the two places where the instruments went in are Anchor Point and Homer. Why? Because these are places you can drive to. These uh, LMA instruments need to be plugged in, and they need an internet connection. So we put one in our AVO Homer site, and we put the other one in the public library in Anchor Point. This was sort of a minimal effort. Normally, these guys go out and put eight or 12 instruments, and they put them completely around so they get good three-dimensional control. Best we could do is get two stations, because it's January in Alaska, to record the data uh, with line of sight to the volcano. So what we found was, Here's these last four eruptions that we've already talked about before. Here's the lightning. The first one, 365 lightning flashes. The second one was one flash. Third one, 28. Fourth one, six. So we had a lot of range, a lot of variation. Here's the durations. The first one was by far the longest. This was the shortest, and then two other medium-sized ones. Here's the plume, nine, three, eight kilometers. So the first one had the highest plume, and these other two were near it, but had were shorter and not as much material came out. And then lastly is the pressure. So this, this is one we've seen before. This was the second highest. Here was the highest, and this is that paradox again, where the highest pressure had the smallest plume and also the least amount, least amount of lightning. So what you can tell just at a glance here is that the longer a volcano, uh, longer an eruption lasts, the more likely you are to get lightning. And I think this, we've seen this before too, that the longer the eruptions last, the more ash particles you put up and each ash particle is a potential charge carrier. So the more particles, the more potential you have for charging, and the more lightning you get out. Um, and again, the paradox of, of very little, this is telling us there's very little ash. And this is interesting for one other reason, because the plume is about three kilometers high, and we have one flash. So another thing we had with Augustine when it erupted was uh, radar data. We don't usually have radar data, but we had uh, radar installed at Kenai for the, uh, the airport there, weather radar called NEXRAD. So the radar's over here at Kenai looking down. So we spot, this is ash from the first eruption. So the eruption occurred at 531 in each of these next several plots. The eruption time is shown in parentheses. The time of the radar observation is shown here. So this is about 11 minutes later. Plume went up, it's being blown this way with the wind. Here's the second one. The eruption was 8.37, the radar was at 8.50, about 13 minutes later. So about the same. 
This is the one that had hardly any ash plume at all. It was detectable, but if you look at the scale, this is scale in dB. Compare this one with the previous one, there's way less ash in it. And this is the second one, this was a plume up to nine kilometers. This one was only up to about three kilometers. Then the latter two had more modest amounts of tephra. This one is uh, 14 minutes later, and this one is uh, 12 minutes later. So the offset uh, from these radar images is similar in each case. This is weather systems. The, this radar system was not actually put in to look at volcanoes. We're lucky to get volcano data from it. It was looking for conditions that lead to icing and problems with airplanes. So it's looking for rain, water droplets of a certain size. So that's what this bit over is over here. Since it's looking for particles of a certain size, if they're water or ash, you still see them in the radar signal. So what this does, this gave us some confirmation of something we already suspected, that there wasn't much ash with that second eruption. Um, so we can put all this data together and look at the sequence of events. Um, so we think that the first eruption, there was a dome prior. This is relatively gas poor. The large eruption followed by a big old gas pocket with hardly any ash, followed by a couple normal ones, normal ones at intervals of just a few hours. So with this conceptual scheme, this gives us a way to take out what we observed at the surface and reconstruct it and say, how do things look at depth prior to the eruption? So this is supposed to be a schematic of a magma conduit. This is a dome up at the top, degas magma, followed by relatively more gas, a large gas pocket, and then another parcel of magma below. So it's a way to take the conceptual scheme of what we observed with our seismic and acoustic and lightning data and sort of reconstruct what were the conditions under the ground that would give rise to these observed conditions at the surface and the instrumental data that go along with them. Um, lastly, a few more details of the lightning. This is from this science paper, and it was the, the first time these kind of observations were made. And I just want to make now the link between the first observation, the first instrumental data we got, and what we already knew from the plume histogram. So this is how the lightning data actually looked. This is electrical signal, and this was the main phase of the eruption, this bit in here. So we suddenly started getting a whole bunch of charging all at once, and then these magenta lines are individual lightning strikes. So we saw this continuous signal when the eruption was actually occurring. We'll see more details of that in the afternoon talk. The other panels here show the transverse distance, zeros right at the volcano. As time went by, the lightning is moving farther and farther away from the volcano. It's being blown downwind, downwind with the plume. Uh, this is showing the amplitude fluctuations of one of the longest pulses, and it, it rather resembles a uh, lightning flash from a thunderstorm. And over here was one of the well-studied lightning flashes early on, this guy right over here. It was shown to be starting at the top of the volcano and propagating upward and about three kilometers long. So of those two eruptions, here's now switching to, this is sort of the raw data when it comes straight off the instrument. Here is the continuous part of the eruption, which produces strong electrical signal. Here's those individual lightning flashes. This is for that first eruption, the one that had 365 lightning flashes. Here is that second eruption. It was smaller and shorter. This is the one with hardly any tephra, yet still there was a continuous electrical signal. This is the one that only had one coherent flash a couple minutes later. So what happened was, just by luck, this is the first time we put such instruments at a volcano. By luck, we happened to get one eruption with a nine kilometer cloud out here. That's our normal ones where most of the lightning's up in the plume. We also happened to catch a short one with a plume only about three kilometers long. So just, just by luck, with our first two instrumental eruptions, we had one of the, from the small group and one from the larger group, tephra rich, tephra poor, gave us a chance to, to see how, how those factors affect the, uh, the activity, the electrical activity. So now, the last thing, and I'm just about done here, I want to compare, we've had, this is our third eruption from Augustine out of all these historical ones where we had uh, instrumental data. The first one was occurred in 1976, then 86, 2006. The duration of the seismic precursors, nine months, nine months, eight and a half. The explosive phase lasted four days, 14 days, 18 days. The dome building phase, three months, seven months, and four months, and finally wound down after about four and a half months. So these are, these are remarkably similar. This, you kind of say that we got this volcano figured out. So we're in a pretty good situation for 20 years from now when it starts to ramp up again. We have a pretty clear idea of how this volcano is likely to behave, at least re retrospectively. And then some other general conclusions. This parametric analysis shows that the explosive eruptions are not all the same. 
we see about a factor of five to 10 variation in the main parameters. So things like the duration, the amplitude, et cetera. There's, there's significant variation in them. The, one, the, the, the surprise was that the ones that had the highest infrasound peak pressure turned out to be mostly gas, and the ones that had the longer durations were the ones that had more tephra. So we learned a couple of a couple take home rules to help us evaluate eruptions at other places when you have both the seismic and the infrasound data. Uh, we think variation in gas distributions, first order, and ascent rate can explain the main characteristics observed, although to be sure I've glossed over a lot of stuff there and you know there are many detailed studies that can be done to try to verify and flesh out those relationships and figure out how the actual mechanisms work. And, um, and the other thing is that these, the new observations show us that there's three main regimes of electrical activity. The continuous activity when the eruptions occurring, the small scale lightning that occurs with small plumes, and then the larger scale lightning with the large plumes. And um, much of what I showed you about the parameters and a separate paper about the lightning are both in press in a USGS professional paper, number 1769. It's due out in weeks. I was told a month and a half ago that this should be out in six to eight weeks, which is about now. Uh, so I can send an email to, to Mark if anybody's interested and try to get a copy of this for you. So thank you very much. suite of eruptions. The OMI data in our neck of the woods, it's at best a couple times a day. And when you're having eruptions every three or four hours, it wasn't enough to get that kind of resolution. It just didn't make a very big, strong signal. It's a pretty modest eruption overall. Uh, that wasn't so clear to me until uh, <coughs> readout occurred a year ago in, 19, in 2009. Um, and readout, I mean, most folks would say that wasn't a very big eruption, but all the pressures and the seismic stuff was at least an order of magnitude higher for readout. And that, that's when we kind of realized that Augustine is actually a pretty small eruption. So small, but well studied, not quite enough to get into those global data sets uh, like, like the OMI. Good idea, though. Is the amount, you said the amount of ash is correlated with longevity. Is that just because the eruption goes longer or because the long eruption? We, as best we can tell, the, the rates are similar, the rate of eruption, so the longer it lasts, you get more volume of material. But as far as why, why does that, I mean, you, if you've got a dome already pushed up, okay, there's your extra material. But if, you're, if other things being equal, uh, it must be the controlling parameters and whatever governs how that parcel of magma moves up into the conduit and sits there must be got. One of the surprises to me, you remember one of the very early slides, one of the ones that seismically going along, it just stops that's a good candidate for somehow being pinched off, although I don't have a very clear mental picture of why they suddenly end. You know, why do you get two million cubic meters and then it just stops abruptly? Three hours later, you get another two million meters. How, how, is, this, how is this working? You know, I, this is the stuff that's just out there in Never Never Land. So to go after those questions, the first thing is, well, tell me how big the conduit is. Well, nobody wants to commit. Nobody will say how big they think the conduit is. And because if you know the conduit dimension and if you know the volume, then you can estimate the vertical extent. So in our case, we have lousy, because it's a remote Aleutian island in winter, we don't have very good volume numbers of the individual uh, eruptions. And then further, we have only first order guesstimates of the conduit dimensions. So unfortunately, it puts that class of problems slightly out of reach. Even though they're incredibly important problems, we, just, we don't have the data to, to say much about them. It's a bit of an uninformed peripheral question, but are Volcani, uh, Volcani and Stromboli and eruptions uh, different divisions in the same classification scheme, or are they completely unrelated in terms of a... Uh, Strombolian is a gentler type of activity. Uh, there's a scale that goes up to Hawaiian, Strombolian, uh, Palaean, Volcanian, Subplinian, Plinian, Ultraplinian. There's all, and they're in, that's increasing explosivity, increasing flux, the thing about Strombolian ones is the basic idea behind it is it's pretty fluid magma. The magma is moving slower than the gases. So the gases go up through the magma and sort of cause disruption. These big bubble bursts and these pretty fire fountain things that you see. That's classic Strombolian. 
with Vulcanian and on up, the magma and the gas are moving at the same rate. They tend to be more gas-rich and thicker pastier lava. So you get high rates, but very brief durations. And then the Plinian and Subplinian ones, you get very high volume rates, huge amounts of material. They're characterized by column collapse. The stuff shoots up so high, oops, too much, falls back down gravitationally. So there's, there's sort of key diagnostics in each of those uh, eruption styles. The Stromboli and Volcano are separated by about, I don't know, 50 maybe Yeah, they're, they're not kilometers. apart. They're both in the yeah. same little piece of art. The Aeolian Islands. And, uh, yeah. So I was curious as to how, how, how two, two, uh, two volcanoes with rather similar, presumably somewhat similar source regions uh, produce different styles of eruption. There's something in the plumbing system. Uh, about how the magma is segregated, stored, and released. The, the volcano is higher silica content and intermittent eruptions. I think the last time it erupted was 1888. And then Stromboli has been erupting every year. It was observed since 2200 BC. Oh, yeah, I saw it this summer. Ah, yeah. Uh, Stromboli's cool because the folks that made the, Strom the uh, Smithsonian catalog of eruptions, they, uh, if they had simply listed every year when Stromboli was known to be active, it would have ta added 10 pages to the catalog alone. <laughs> so they just put, you know, from 2200 up until such and such a time, you know, continually active or something like that, saving 10 pages of printing. So this is back in the old days when people still printed books, you know. But that's a different discussion. What's happened since? Uh, the dome grew for a while and finally stopped and slowed down and then it's gradually been quieting down and going back to sleep. We uh, have a study looking at the, n the number of rock falls. They peaked the year it erupted and it's been gradually going back down, uh, kind of roughly exponential decay with a pretty long time. Is there a good database of images of the dome growth at all? Or I, mean, I think so. publicly available or not? Well, I know we did some other new things we put in this time. We put time-lapse cameras, mm -hmm. and those data have been downloaded and archived. I, th I don't know if they're on the public web page. Uh, I know they exist. Uh, if you send me a note afterward, I can check into that for you and see, see if they're there. Charlie? Yeah, um, you know, high pressure, so long time period, I think you're recording. Did you have any chemistry of the gas, which might be needed to that at all? Not this time. Um, you mean uh, you're talking about the, the seismograms that had those long tails, um, or the, the sort of larger bubble burst, larger pressure. gas pockets? The, the acoustic pressure with the top block. Ah, never thought about that. Uh, normally the volcanologists say that the two most important gases are water and SO2, and then it drops off dramatically and all the other gases are less than that. So I haven't, I haven't ever really heard too much discussion about whether uh, very dense gases in smaller amounts would be enough to, to greatly change such behavior. Carbon dioxide is quite more dense as well. It's yeah. Often Carbon dioxide is also the least, one of the least soluble gases, so it's particularly in the case of slow ascent. By the time you get to shallow depths, most of the CO2 is, is long gone. Thanks, Steve, and let him go to lunch. Great, thank you.